It's alive! It's alive! Seriously, it is alive. Hi, I'm Gardener Scott, and I discuss everything gardening so that you can become a better gardener. Today, let's discuss soil. Apart from the gardener, soil is the most important thing in the garden that determines success or failure. You may remember me saying in earlier videos that 80% of plant problems can be traced to soil. If you have good soil, you probably have good plants. But what does that mean, having good soil? Well, today I'm going to get into the science a little bit into some art of how to build good soil. And by the end of this video, you should fully understand soil. As we begin, I'd like to differentiate between soil and dirt. It's one of my pet peeves. I think too many gardeners refer to what they're growing in as dirt. And dirt really is one of those throwaway words. We make things dirty. Dirt is unclean. There's no life in it. Whereas soil is important. Soil is something that we grow in and that benefits plants. A definition of soil from the Soil Science Society of America says that soil is a mixture of minerals, dead and living organisms, organic materials, air, and water. That's soil. It's so much more than dirt. And I first started learning about soil back in 2004 when I was going through my Master Gardener training. And I learned that if you garden, you should think of it as the living soil. And I further gained information when I got this wonderful book, Teeming with Microbes, by Jeff Lowenfels and Wayne Lewis. All of this information really helped me learn the importance of soil. And I encourage you to get this book. I'll put a link to it below. Because when you appreciate soil and what it can do for your plants, it will make you a better gardener. In that Master Gardener course, I learned that textbook soil should be 45% mineral, 25% air, 25% water, and 5% organic matter. And I've seen that same ratio in many other academic sources since then. It's the accepted ratio. The problem is that many of us gardeners only focus on one of those components, like the organic matter. We think if we just add a lot of compost to the soil, that will solve all the problems. Well, we might have other issues like compaction, where there's not enough air, and that's why our plants aren't growing. So consider all four of those factors as important and trying to get close to that magic ratio when you're developing your garden soil. Another important piece of information we need to know is our soil tilth. Now tilth is the soil's texture, structure, and fertility. And so what does that mean? Texture refers to the particles that make up your soil. And those particles will be clay, silt, or sand. The important piece to understand is that those different particles range greatly in size from the very, very small clay particle to the relative very, very large size of a sand particle. So let's try to put this in perspective. Clay is so small that you probably need a microscope to see it. So let's say a single clay particle is the size of a grain of salt. Well, silt is quite a bit larger than that. So a particle of silt might be as big as a radish when compared to the size of the clay. Quite a bit larger. But now let's compare that to the grain of sand that makes up our soil texture. And the sand, by comparison, would be as large as a wheelbarrow. So you have everything in your soil from a little grain of salt all the way up to the size of a wheelbarrow. And now condense that down to 
what makes up your individual soil. And you can get an understanding of what the texture of your soil is. Now I have a sandy loam soil. I know that because I had a soil test done and that's what they told me. The USDA has developed a soil texture triangle that associates the various combinations of sand, silt, and clay. And depending on how much percent of each of those particles you have in your soil, you can identify what kind of soil you have. For gardeners, the best soil is in the middle of the triangle. It's loam. But if you have a higher percentage of one of the other particles, it might be a sandy loam like mine, or a clay loam, or a silt loam. The key is that you want a mix of these different particles. And ideally, it's going to be 30 to 50% sand, 30 to 50% silt, only 20 to 30% clay, and 5 to 10% organic matter. When you have all of those pieces working together, then you've got a good soil. How those particles fit together determine the structure of your soil. And so each of those individual particles through chemical or biological processes will stick together and form aggregates. Each of those aggregations of particles is referred to as a ped. And the ped can be many different shapes. It might be ball shaped or it might be a cube or a plate or a column. The important piece is that all these peds are fitting together to form your soil. And as they fit together, there are little spaces in between. That's known as pore space. And it's in that pore space that we have air pockets. Or maybe the water drifts down when you water or when it rains and it fills some of those pockets with water. Those are also the spaces within the soil where the organisms move. So all of these pieces together determine your soil structure. Before I discuss the soil fertility component, which is very important, I want to highlight why understanding your texture and structure is important. Because if you understand how your soil is put together, it can really help you in your gardening. For instance, you probably know if you have a very sandy soil, what that means is you've got lots of pockets between particles and aggregates. So the water just drains right on through. But if your soil is very high in clay, because those particles are so small, you don't have those air pockets and you don't have the ability for the water to wind its way through. So it's understanding how the particle sizes fit together that might help you in fixing some of your soil problems. And often the fix is an organic matter like compost. Because when you have that very small clay particle and you put some compost in it, well, relatively speaking, the compost is huge. And it's creating a lot more pore space within your clay soil. If you have a very sandy soil and you add compost, well, now a lot of those big pockets, the pore spaces, will be filled by pieces of the compost, which will help retain some of the water. So we don't just say add compost because it sounds nice. Adding compost really can affect the structure of your soil. And it's in the garden where that third piece of soil tilth really comes into play, and that's soil nutrition. You can have the best structure in the world, but if there's no nutrients in it, nothing will grow. And that's a piece that many of us gardeners really tend to focus on, improving the nutrition within our soil. Well, it's the life in the soil that creates that nutrition. We've got bacteria, protozoa, fungi, many other soil microorganisms, small animals like earthworms, and together, they create the nutrition that our plants need. You may have seen this diagram. It's referred to as the soil food web because all of these individual living organisms act as food for another organism. And all together, they create a circle as they decompose and as they feed and as they excrete whatever it is they excrete. 
All of those pieces create our soil nutrition. In the 1980s, Dr. Elaine Ingham and her colleagues from Oregon State University did a lot of research into soil, specifically the microbes in the soil and how they all played together. And it's much of their work that is featured in the book Teeming with Microbes. The basic idea is that we have two general types of organisms that will influence the nutrition within our soil. Primarily, we've got bacteria, or fungi, and they'll work differently to create the nutrients and benefit the soil overall. You already know that I like to use compost in my garden, and I make my own compost. Well, compost is most often broken down by bacteria, and there's many different types of bacteria that benefit the soil. There are some bacteria that can take nitrogen from the air and actually infuse it into the soil. But most often the bacteria in compost will take the nutrients that are in the compost organic material, like all that waste we get from our garden, and they'll decompose it and break it down. And a lot of that nitrogen remains either in that decomposed waste or in the bodies of that small bacteria. And a lot of that is transformed into ammonium, which plants can use. And specialized bacteria will further break down the ammonium into nitrates. And most of our vegetable garden plants love nitrates. That's the form of nitrogen that they need. And you buy any type of fertilizer, chances are that nitrogen in the fertilizer is in the form of nitrates. That's ideal for the plants that we're growing on an annual basis throughout our landscape and our garden. And now we get down to those two different types of soil. When we make compost and add that, it becomes a bacterial dominant soil, typically high in nitrates. But the other end of the spectrum is fungi related soil. And so when we have wood chips or decomposing trees, it's the fungi that's breaking down that organic material. And so in areas with a lot of those woody materials, you have a soil that's dominated by fungi. And you'll find it in places like forests and orchards and areas with a lot of wood chips. The fungi do the same thing. They'll add the nutrients back to the soil. But where we could have a potential problem in our garden is that the fungi don't do so well in high nitrate environments. And so now we need to start thinking about that balance between a bacterial soil and a fungal soil. So now we can talk about how understanding soil can really benefit you and the plants within your garden. Because if you're growing vegetables in beds, then a bacterial dominant soil can be a very good thing. And that's why there's so many gardeners that recommend adding compost to your soil, because the compost is loaded with beneficial bacteria and microorganisms. And so in addition to the improvement of the soil structure, you're infusing your soil and inoculating it with the bacteria that will continue to provide nutrients for the plants. But in areas of my garden where I'm growing fruit bushes and, and fruiting vines and adding my fruit trees, I'm not as concerned about compost in the soil. I'd rather have a lot of that fungal development so the mycorrhizal connections can develop. So that's why I use a lot of wood chips as a mulch around the fruiting plants. They're going to be perennials. They're in place for a long time. And it does take a long time for the fungi to break down these woody products. But when they do, they're adding the kind of nutrients that all of these fruit producing plants are looking for. It's not so much bacteria. It's fungally dominated. The key to all of this in developing a healthy soil is to feed the soil food web. And that begins by adding organic material to the soil because that bacteria and that fungi needs it as food. And all of those other organisms rely on the bacteria and the fungi to get the whole system working. 
You can do that by amending your soil or by adding mulches on top of it. But you need to ensure you've got organics in your soil. But you don't have to overdo it. Because remember, we only need 5% organic matter in our soil to be textbook. That's a lot when you're looking at a big space. But when you break it down to just one individual bed at a time, it's very doable. And it's something you should definitely do. And there are things that you shouldn't do. Nature has this wonderful system where everything works together within the soil food web. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not all good. There are bad bacteria and there are bad fungi, but the whole system works in balance. So if the bad starts developing too much, the good comes in and increases and fights back the bad. And it all stays in balance to best benefit soil and our plants. But if you start adding a lot of artificial chemicals to the soil, you drastically impact what's happening. When you add the chemical fertilizers, or the pesticides, or the herbicides, or the fungicides, you may think you're just putting those on your plant, but they will find their way into the soil. And in the soil, they can disrupt the entire system. So the balance is lost. And you might actually be killing some of the beneficial microorganisms that could fix the problems in your soil. Without them, now that gives rise to the bad organisms and your garden and your plants might suffer. I think understanding soil and the soil food web is very important to help ensure success within the garden. And if I can break it down to just a couple thoughts, the ideas would be to think about organic material. That's really the base of everything. Add organics to the soil. Add organics on top of the soil. All of the plants that you are growing in your garden, add them back into the soil as a compost or a mulch. And if you generate and help encourage that entire process, that entire cycle, you should see, in fact, you will see better plants within your garden. Please let me know your questions below and any comments about soil and maybe what you've learned. If you'd like to see more videos, please subscribe to the Gardener Scott channel and do click on the bell because that notifies you when the new videos and my live stream are coming out. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and share it. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.